I'm in Tarabishi and I play multiple hats, but for the purposes of tonight, um, I am the um, president and CEO of the International Council for Small Business, ICSB. It is the oldest and largest nonprofit organization in the world, helping support micro, small and medium enterprises. And I am just delighted that you all are here at the same time. And I play another hat. Um, I am the deputy chair of the Department of Management at the GW School of Business in Washington, D.C. And so I play, I'm a prof teaching professor there. I teach entrepreneurship, small business, um, innovation and creativity. And uh, so as you can see, what I do with GW and what I do with ICSB are tied to the hip. At the, at the end of the day, it's about helping micro businesses, small businesses, medium sized businesses to grow and prosper prosper here. Um, so before we get into the session, I wanted to make sure that Dr. Winslow is, um, is ready to go. Dr. Winslow, greetings. Are you, are you all ready? I am ready, but I'm okay. not able to turn on my camera, but that's okay. I'm, I'm ready. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I got it. I, I, I'm going to make you a co-host. Now you can turn on your <laughs> camera. I forgot. I, I think I muted you. I made you uh, that. Here you are. And what a nice hotel room, Dr. Winslow. What a great hotel room. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a real hotel room or it's a backup, but it looks great. <laughs> well, it's so great so, to be here. Greetings, everyone. Anyan Hateo. Greetings, everyone. <laughs> good. Um, let me introduce him because uh, Dr. Winslow, as he is also a friend of mine, but he is also the chair of the International Council for Small Business. He is chair of the ICSB board. So I have to officially recognize him in his role. And so uh, uh, Chairman uh, Winslow, good evening. How was your trip? And why don't you say welcome everybody in all the different languages you know? <laughs> well, yes, well, 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 thank you, Dr. Terabishi. Um, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for um, putting this forum together and to bring us all together. It's technology has allowed us to be connected. And so, Anya and Hatseo, Bonjour, bonsoir. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, I am Winslow Sargent, the chair of the International Council for Small Business. I'm also the senior advisor of, and the head of capital markets for Genesis. It's an M&A, a mergers and acquisition firm lo located outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I serve on a number of boards, university boards, and, um, and entrepreneurship is core to what we do, um, we say that the entrepreneur is an optimist, is a person, or is a person who sees the future and who wants to engage and who wants to solve problems and the problem of humanity. And so, with humane entrepreneurship, we know that um, the, you know that the best solutions are solutions that address the human condition. And so, I'm just so pleased to be with um, thought leaders like yourself and, and, and those who um, have a lot to, to, to bring and, and, um, and the convening authority of ICSB is around the world. It's something that we um, take great pride in. And so I just wanna thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and to, and to dialogue and to come up with some, not just to state what the problem, but also actively work on what are some of the solutions and and also the big idea something that we're not even discussing so i'm just thankful to be here and once again thank you dr terabishi for this opportunity and thank you thank i want to thank the board of icsb and and all the members and, and all our partners um, for allowing th for this session and i look forward to to having a great session thank you thank you dr winslow before we get into the presentation and explaining what humane entrepreneurship is, and I'd like to recognize, I think Dr. Winslow and I would like to recognize these individuals that have contributed to this, to this, to the movement of this of this concept and, and theory forward here. So in particular, first of all, I want to recognize personally and at the forefront, unfortunately, he is not able to attend today, I am, but hopefully he'll drop in, is Dr. Kishan Kim. And I consider him as one of the originators and starters of humane entrepreneurship. You may also consider the founder of humane entrepreneurship and with me on it, but he pushed it more 
than anybody else around the world. So I want to personally recognize Kishan Kim for his leadership for, for this, for humane entrepreneurship. From an idea that I started with him in a car in Seoul in South Korea to where it is today, Kishan was the driving force behind it. So we want to recognize Kishan Kim for this, Professor Kishan Kim for this. But also there's other people that have to come, that have to play a major role in promoting this theory. And, and, and the way I have to do it, it wasn't just Kishan Kim or I, and that's it, or, or some other people, but there's other people also that helped contribute to this. Another person here that um, now is Professor Emeritus um, is Professor Paul Swears, and um, that was with us in Seoul when we came up with the idea. So I wanna recognize in him as well for the originator of the idea. Saying this, once the idea was created, once the idea was formed, to take it to where it was, to where it was today, we had to have champions. We had to have people with intellectual firepower, with the connections, with the network, with, with the belief that they can execute. And the first person that comes to my mind that has contributed tremendously to this, I consider him a very dear friend and a remarkable human being and a, a powerhouse, um, is Dr. Roberto Parente from, Sal from Salerno, Italy. He has made a major contribution to this him and his colleagues and his team of, um, of, of uh, Massimiliano, of everybody there that was, well, it was there, Antonio Botti and everybody there from them that just made it amazing. We had something called the Salerno Declaration, supporting humane entrepreneurship. So Professor Parente, we recognize you for the leadership and your powerful stance on humane entrepreneurship. And also from another part of the world, more importantly as well, and it was the Jakarta Declaration, was and the incoming chair of ICSB, Mer, uh, Mr. Hermawan Katarjaya, he also made a declaration supporting humane entrepreneurship. And that was just an amazing and remarkable movement of globalizing the concept. So Hermawan, we recognize you for, for, your, for your strong stance on this and, and history will speak very highly of you in terms of humane entrepreneurship. Now we went from Europe to Asia. Now let's switch back to North Africa, and even the Middle East, uh, the, the immediate past chair of ICSB, Mr. Ahmad Osman, also was a major, major uh, player in the concept of humane entrepreneurship and bringing it to the forefront. So, so Mr. Osman, his leadership and his impact on this topic is well recognized. Now saying this, there's also other, what I call them actors in this domain from, uh, from Jeff Alves, the, the, uh, the uh, editor-in-chief of GISP for supporting it, for uh, Professor Analia Pastran from Argentina with, with her mo motion to bring in sustainability SDGs to this concept, and many, 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 Ruben Ascua as well, and many other players that came and actors that came and contributed piece by piece by piece to this was a major, major impact here. So saying this, now we have a new generation of leaders coming up, new, new thought leaders coming up. And these are currently the managing editors of the JSBM and also just Dr. Katia Passerini and Eric Liguiri that have, and, 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 and Je, Dr. Jeff Formsby as well, the editor, Dr. Alex De Noble as well, all have pushed this to the next iteration of it. So as you can see, this is a one, not a one person show or a two person show, it is a global, a global movement. Now you understand. Now you see where how this has started from the back seat of a car in Seoul to where we are today and globally here. But what is humane entrepreneurship? What does it even mean? It sounds nice, but what does it really mean? And how does it even evolve? So I have put some slides together. Unfortunately, Winslow Sargent was busy running around doing a million things as usual. So I will be presenting the slides. But while I present the slides, and we've done this in the past, so you probably say, oh no, they know what they were doing. We've worked enough extensively together that we're comfortable with each other that we kind of bounce the ideas before they're even finished. He can continue the idea further. So I'll present the slide and then I'll ask him to jump in and contribute more thoughts to it. And, and he's, you're probably gonna be adding some ideas here that are just gonna be really, really good, which will upset me because they're really good. <laughs> So then I will try to outdo him with another idea. So you can see that this is gonna happen very soon here. So let me start with the slides and then we can go from there. So uh, let me just quickly go here, All right? And let me share the slide. So um, 
Let me see. Okay. So let me hopefully, do you all see the slides? Winslow, you all see the slides? Yes, I, I'm able to see the slides. Good, excellent. So let's let's start. So the concept tonight is humane entrepreneurship. And you probably, if you Google it and, and, and look at it, there's gonna be a lot of things coming around. Even today, I, I even Googled what is humane entrepreneurship and Google came up with a definition for me, which I was very pleased for. So I realized it's like, okay, it's legitimate now because Google has it as part of their questions. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. But what is humane entrepreneurship? So let me go to the next slide here, right? Let me forget this, Dr. Keishan is not here. So we'll replace with Keishan with Dr. Winslow, but let's not go to the next slide. Before we define humane entrepreneurship, before we get into the definition of what is humane entrepreneurship, we have to understand the context of how it evolves. So what we call here, we call it the global landscape. I think it's better for Dr. Winslow to explain what do we mean by the global landscape here? I think he has a better picture and he's more eloquent in explaining this. Dr. Winslow, I'm gonna head the floor to you to talk about the global landscape. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Terabishi. What we know with regard to the global landscape um, that over the last um, quarter century or so, we've seen so many changes and a lot of it has been due to technological change. And so we've seen, um, uh, how technology has impacted us. It has made us more in contact with, with each other. It's created wealth, but this wealth has not been distributed equally. And, and also with technology, you know, the thing about technology, it, it's a disruptor. And so we talk about disruption, but what has happened is that with technology, it has, you know, this creative destruction, this pull and pull, this pull and push that we have with technology, for example, it, it has this creative destruction. On one hand, it creates, but on the other hand, it destroys. It destroys what's called the incumbents, but it creates something new. Over the last, say, 20 years, we've seen actually more destruction than creation because technology has allowed us to actually use less, fewer people um, to do the same functions. Well, what that has done is that has caused di dislocations throughout, say, the supply chain. And so what happened um, on the buildup or the add-on to the Millennium Development Goals, which were eight goals that started in 2000 and then were superseded by what's called Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, which were 17 goals, the the Millennium Development Goals fo focus on poverty and health, but the Sustainable Development Goals started to look at the planet itself and employment and health and, and the humanity. And so when we look at, at um, the global landscape, how do we move forward in, in the fourth industrial revolution? Um, how do we make sure that equality and distribution of resources will take place. And so that's why we're pleased with sustainable development goals, which were adopted by the UN in 2015. There are 17 goals. And these 17 goals really take a look at what do we need to achieve, say by 2030, to make a planet that's that, you know, that is sustainable. I mean, how do we make sure that um, there's, you know, there's health and there's and there's food and, and an environment that works for everyone. And, and so that's where we, we built on the SDGs, but also back then we recognized that the SDGs for them to be accomplished and it was a fourth and, and it was the leading by Dr. Terabishi. He recognized very early on that, that, on, that entrepreneurship, that small businesses are vital, are key uh, in achieving these SDGs. And so now what, when we look at the landscape, we look at entrepreneur, we look at those who are on the ground, those who, whether you're in the cities, whether you're in a favela, whether you're in rural areas, whether you're um, not in the mainstream in terms of the, with large populations, you still can contribute. You still have a, a significant role to play. And through entrepreneurship, through, um, you know, coupling technology and commerce, um, we can solve a lot of problems. And so that's how the global landscape has changed. 
But the whole definition of entrepreneurship is not anymore um, build it at all costs. How, how do we make sure that we empower the individual? Because once again, when we create these new technologies, they're for the human, right? The economy is, is built to serve the needs of human beings. It's not to serve the needs of technology for itself, but it's to serve the needs of human beings while at the same time not destroying the planet, making sure that things are sustainable. And so that's how the landscape has changed. An ex exception, just absolutely exceptional, and extremely eloquent. Um, so what does that mean? That means when, when, when we started to talk about this, we realized based on research that came from the World Bank, and it was a small line written in a report that ICSB, that actually I read, and I thought this is really interesting here. And it was a small statistic that, that had such impact on, on the magnitude, it was buried in a report in the World Bank. And then when we started reading this, said, oh my God, this is a major, major issue here. And, and, and it's simple, and I, I'm gonna let the chair of ICSB mention it because when he mentioned it, he does it with such drama, with such eloquence that it has much more impact. So I'm gonna give it to him. I'm gonna tee it off now. <laughs> all right, so this is all yours. Go for this one. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Terabishi. Well, what we know um, coming out of the World Bank and, and, and the Sustainable Development Goals, remember this number, 600 million. I wanna say it again, 600 million. What does that mean? Well, over the next 15 years, 600 million jobs must be created just to keep pace with the population growth and foster greater participation in the economy. And so when you break it down, 600 divided by 15, you get 40 million jobs needed that are needed to be created every year. And so 600 million, four, that means 40 million jobs must be created every year just to keep pace. And so that's why this number is so important. That, but how will these jobs be created? We know that large businesses are, rel are not hiring, that the majority of the businesses in, in, in the world, a large percentage of these businesses are small businesses, are SMEs. Uh, there are some countries you're looking at 90% plus, but also we also know that uh, uh, in many countries, these business, a lot of these businesses are informal, which means they don't exist on paper. So this is the dilemma we're facing is that we have so many businesses that are informal, but yet the majority of businesses are SMEs, but yet we need to create 600 million jobs, 40 million per year. And so that's how the landscape has changed. And, and what is fascinating about this number that he just raised, this was pre-COVID. This was before COVID. So I'm just wondering, I'm just curious, do we need to go back now and say, well, that's not 600 million. It's maybe a little bit more. It's maybe 900 million, may, maybe a trillion in the job because of what COVID has created. And, and that's the challenge here. So what does this mean? So now we understand the context that the global landscape is changing. And this is the challenge that's forthcoming. But let's continue on. So what has changed over the past 20 years? Starting, we know that starting and businesses and growing businesses have also changed dramatically. You can start a business right, from your home you can start a business automatically from, 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 your, from your kitchen, right? That you can go in and start and start a business, right? And, and, and growing a business has also changed. It is not what it used to be, right? We also know at the same time as these has changed, that there's this concept of the 17 sustainable development goals that basically are saying these are flag posts, posts that we need to be paying attention to. The other day I heard that climate now is being used more and more in, 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 in TV 
when it comes to reporting the weather, saying due to climate change, these storms are happening, right? This is not gonna go away. This is gonna escalate further and further. So now we understand that the context is dynamically and rapidly changing. And I believe personally to the worse, not to the better, to the worse, right? So at the same time, let us go back and look at something from a different perspective. And this is what our research at ICSB that we have been doing here, right? And a concept that we started looking at in developing this idea of humane entrepreneurship, right? Now, again, I will mention the World Bank. The World Bank, um, about maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, created, wrote a report called The Wealth of Nations. Right? It's not a very popular report in the sense that everybody talks about it here, right? But it was more of a, more of a thinking report, right? A cognitive report. Most of the people at the World Bank have PhDs and higher degrees here. And, and they looked at it, right? And, and they wrote this report talking about this concept of the wealth of nations, right? And, and in this book, they asked about this important question. They introduced this concept of what do we mean by wealth? of a nation as a complementary indicator to gross domestic product. Everybody's familiar, all the economists and everybody's familiar, all the countries measure the GDP. How's the GDP going? If you look at the US now, it's been improving because of COVID, but now maybe, maybe it's slowing down a little bit. China's rapidly increasing. Other countries in the Economist, the last page of the Economist uh, magazine, they put the GDP indicators at the last page or before the last page. It's usually positive or negative, and people can understand it. What is the GDP and what's going on? But the World Bank kind of sent in a curveball and said, but what about if we look at it from not just the gross domestic product? Let's look at it from something else. Let's try to measure it versus just the GDP, which is one indicator, but not the only indicator. And in this report, and this is the report where I flagged, and I said, this is the foundation of our premise on humane entrepreneurship. And this is when we started connecting the dots of this theory, of this concept of humane entrepreneurship, right? And what they talked about is they said, let us look at the wealth of nations from three different perspectives aside from GDP. And that is produced capital, natural capital, and human capital. Produced capital, what we produce, natural, you know, the natural resources that are available, but finally, the human capital. This is such, it has a significant impact on, on the way we look at humanity, we look at the wealth of nations, we look at economies. Can we look at all three aspects? Now, let me ask Winslow to comment on this, on his reaction to this, and for all of you to actually reflect on as he's commenting on it. Dr. Winslow? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Terabishi. This is very key because so often when we think of wealth, we think of natural resources or um, um, elements, oil and gas and bauxite and gold. And, and, but those, those are things that come out of the ground. But what we see is that it's the human, it's the human um, talent that is able to use their skill set to make finished products to create the GDP. That if you look at nations who, in general, have um, based their natural based their GDP on on some things that are coming out of the ground, that's that's those nations are blessed in terms of they have natural resources. But the nations that actually um, um, in, that have developed the human talent. Those nations are actually wealthier and they're more sustainable because they're using that human talent um, to, for sustainability to develop new products and new, and, and, and new cures and, and, new, and they know how to apply it and they know how to finish those products where they can export, but also they can do good. And so what we're seeing more and more that, that education is really the key that if you want to become one of the wealthier nations, then that means that you have to really um, look, at, look at it from the human point of view, 
to develop the human talent. That if you have a choice between, um, you know, um, a gold mine or a mine of human beings, then the sustainable action would be would be to develop or to invest in those human talent, the, the, your people, because they're able to use that to develop and to create. And so that's what we're seeing more. Thank you. You know, I, I know I, I'm a professor at UW. You would have gotten A in this response here. <laughs> because if you look at it, here are some statistics that are, are, are discussing it on the wealth of nations. Human capital accounts for nearly 65% of global wealth. 65% accounts for human capital, but only 41% in low income countries. This is based on the World Bank report. As con countries continue to grow in the 21st century, human capital will become more important to both the country and the global wealth. Yet again, and I stress this because this is where we started to realize there is a disparity here. Yet only 41% in low income countries versus 65% right, of global wealth. You could see the major significance here, right? And, and, and to add to this, based on another report that we got, in high income OECD countries, which are partners of ours, right? Human capital can reach 70% of total wealth, the OECD countries, 70% of total wealth. Basically, these economies do not have that do not have reduced supply of natural capital, but rather added produce capital, they created produce capital, including human capital as infrastructure to their total wealth. I don't know the impact or the significance of this, but it's written clearly on the wall. What has these countries have developed to be such advanced? They have invested in their people and they have perfected the production of their capital. Dr. Winslow, you wanna jump in on this? Yes, um, and, and this is very key. And, and so you point out really good, good statistics that um, something that we should be mindful of is that the human um, is, is, the, is the vehicle that will make use of, of resources. And so that's where, uh, that's what, why the university or higher education or well, K through 12, as we call it, but also higher ed is so important that if you can invest in your people, if you can invest in all your people, men, women, young, old, everyone, the disabled, that if you can develop um, the human mind and the human resources, then they'll use those abilities to, uh, to generate commerce. Commerce that's sustainable, commerce that's that's solving problems, whether in health, because gold is nice, um, diamonds are nice, oil is nice, but it's not going to develop new, uh, new treatments for, for disease. It's the human beings that see, that will use those elements and use those resources that will come up with new technologies, with new cures, with new foods. And so that's why we have to develop a human being and we have to empower them us because that's where the growth is and that's where the wealth is created. So basically the production of human capital and also of produced capital can be best embodied by entrepreneurship. That combination of both is what we thought or personally we thought that ICSD should be fo focused on. The combination of human capital to the element of produced capital. This is where the word humane entrepreneurship started to evolve. The concept of humanity, the concept of humans first, then entrepreneurship was, was, was founded with that concept here. And to be honest with you, on the sidebar, when we first mentioned this idea of humane entrepreneurship, a lot of people laughed at us. They kind of said, what is this humane entrepreneurship? Are you opening up shelters for cats and dogs? You know, is this a humane center for, for, for animals that are on the street? And we had to educate them saying, no, no, no. It's this concept of humanity first. 
And they even ridiculed us even further. They said, no, no, it's not humanity first. It's IT, it's technology, it's, 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 it's basically disruption, it's, it's high tech, it's AI, it's all this stuff that needs to be focused on. And yet we said, no, not that humanity first, humans first. And in 2015, 2016, when we came up with this term, we were considered the minority on this. We were considered kind of saying, oh, this, this organization is kind of out there in, in this thought process. But slowly, we started people seeing this concept evolving faster and faster. We started seeing words as human-centered management or human-centered workflows. Even more recently, we started seeing humane pop up in different concepts. Even currently, we saw something recently, as most recently from other organizations, as human-centered production. Production evolving around humans. Now, has it to do with COVID-19? Of course it has to do with COVID-19 because realize the world can stop because humanity is being impacted. But driven by the main pillars of what we call opportunity, resources, habitat, as regarded as the driving force of economic development worldwide, we said entrepreneurship is driven by humanity. Humanity are in the driver's seat of this, of this concept of entrepreneurship. And that's where we started our academic research. It's nice to talk about it, but we needed to ground it with research. We needed to ground it with a conceptual model of what it means. So saying, right, some of the questions we ask, how do we increase the production of human and produced capital? Also address the need that was eloquently presented, right, by Dr. Winslow, that we need to create 40 million quality jobs per year and also address the sustainable development goals. It's a nice math problem to all give you. Imagine that you're sitting in a classroom saying, okay, how do we do all of this? And you have 45 minutes to address this, right? And that's the challenge. That is the challenge we put forth to our global community worldwide, saying, how do we approach this? How do we talk about this? How do we articulate this? How do we conceptualize this? And we unleash the ICSB network. We unleash the Professor Roberto Parente, Hermawan, Ahmed Osman, Analia, Adnan, Vicky, Rita, all our board members became champions of this and said, let me look at it from the Australia perspective. Let me look at it from the French perspective. Let me look at it from the Italian perspective. Let's look at it from the Indonesia, from the Korea. We started having a global dialogue on this. But at its heart, what we know, the solution to this revolves around the concept of humane entrepreneurship. There have been leaders like Norris Kruger, like a lot of people coming and talking about focus on the ecosystems, focus on this, focus on this. And we looked at everything. We looked at all the different perspectives of it. But the model that I will present tonight, it is one model of many models here, but the way I have articulated, the way I've conceptualized it, right, to move us forward. And one of, it was one of the first articles ever produced on humane entrepreneurship that was uh, with Dr. Kisham Kim and Dr. Bay. Parallel to this was another article written by Parente and his research team, right? We produced this, uh, this question, what is this humane entrepreneurship theory, right? And we defined it as the following. And, and if you, I'm gonna read you the definition of it and you're probably saying, I don't understand it, which is okay because it's a little bit complex. But once you see the model, you'll understand how it all relates. What we have called it, what I have defined it, here is very simple and succinct. It is the virtuous and sustainable integration of entrepreneurship, leadership, and human resource management in which successful implementation leads to a beneficial increase in wealth and quality job creation perpetuated in a continuous cycle. That is my definition of humane entrepreneurship. I'll read it one more time for effect and maybe for you to process it. It's virtuous and sustainable integration of entrepreneurship, leadership, and human resource management in which successful implementation leads to a beneficial increase in wealth and quality job creation perpetuated in a continuous cycle. Now, the visual representation of this. 
what does this mean? It means it has to follow a couple of, of, of ideas of what I call pillars to make it happen, right? Virtuous means having or showing high moral standards, righteous, good, moral, ethical, upright, upstanding, high-minded, principled, exemplary. That's what virtuous means. Sustainable means able to be maintained at a certain rate of level, not a one-time deal. Integration, the action or process of integrating both economic and political integration. They have to be aligned and they have to be integrated. And then virtuous plus sustainable integration is key. All these pieces of the machine have to fit together to be virtuous. And the way to do this is the following. Here's the model, as simple as it is. And let me start with the negative and then walk you through to the ideal or to the virtuous. We know, we've seen, we've watched movies, we've seen many examples where companies come into an environment, come into a city, come into a town, right? And use its resources, pollute its waters, contaminate its soil, kill its people, take the resources, cut the, cut the trees, burn everything down, right? Make, make the climate horrible, right? Do not care about the ecosystem around it, right? Abuse its people, abuse its everything around it just to create wealth and then leave, right? They're in it for the money and they're out. This is what I call harmful, humane entrepreneurship. It's non-humane. It is as vicious as you can get. We've seen so many movies. I can tell you so many movies that we've seen and we are sick to our stomachs watching them. But it's true. And history has shown us those companies. Right? Those are the ones that we have to act on. The government has to act on. The people, the watchdogs, society have to act on to stop them. Because that's harmful humane entrepreneurship. Then the, there's companies that are not that bad, right? But they, they, they start with a good intention, but then it gets bad very fast. It's a vicious and disconnected, disadvantaged and a broken cycle. It will never be fixed because the way it started was wrong from the beginning, right? And no matter what you try to make it better, it still does not work. It is not as harmful, but it is negative. And you can me measure the negative impact. And the quicker you seize it, the better off you are, right? And those ones are the ones that we should avoid and be watchful of and not let them perpetuate, okay? And those are the ones that we should integrate both the government, the policymakers, everybody in society to stop those type of companies, individuals, and groups that are doing this. The other part of this is what I call the moderate humane entrepreneurship. And that's the positive side. They're non-virtuous, but they're, they're trying to integrate, but the pieces of them trying to do good is almost there, but it's not continuous. It's a one-shot deal, maybe twice, and then they stop. They can't figure out how to continue it, right? And that's something that we can help through education, through intervention, through support, through, through many different systems in place, we can turn this into a continuous cycle, right? It's, it's making the engine smoother, making it more, more continuous. And the ideal one is the ones that we should invest a lot in. They're virtuous, they're sustainable, they're integrating, they're beneficial, and they have a cycle. It's just, an, it's an autopilot. That's where I believe the SDGs can play a big role. The SDGs can help us with both ideal and moderate, right? And can help us avoid the negative and the harmful. Let me stop here and ask Dr. Winslow to comment on this. Yes, Dr. Teravishi, what you've outlined is, is, um, is important that we define um, what it means to be humane entrepreneurship and give some examples. And that's why it's so important to, um, to have the, 
the contrapositive to show what is not uh, humane entrepreneurship um, in terms of, of your example, but also show what is. And so that's, and, and we go back to um, that it's not a, it's not a, a mutually exclusive to have entrepreneurship, to have growth and to have sustainability and to also care about the human. You know, what I like about your definition, it talks about the virtuous, it talks about le leadership, but it's centered around human resource management, the human, the individual, how to make sure that we optimize the abilities of, so those who have the talent and those who have the drive and who have the determination can be at their best. And that's what we see in terms of humane entrepreneurship is that we know that throughout all of the different types of revolutions, the first industrial, second and the third, and now into the fourth, these were driven by people who wanted to create something to help humanity. At times, the, there were creations that uh, were not quite in keeping with sustainability, but in hindsight, now we know. And because we know, that's why it has been a evolution or it has been a progression or such that we're moving towards humane, humane entrepreneurship because for sustainability, we have to have a different model. And so that's why um, your thesis is so correct because it addresses where we need to be to have true sustainability. And, and this is where, the, uh, thank you. This is where the SMEs come in. This is where the small businesses come in. This is where the beauty and the power of small businesses come in. For me personally, I see a small business and, and the way they operate and the way they give, and you, we know them, we see them, we've been working with them for years, right? They, they're in everyone's neighborhood. There is an every, we, we work with them throughout the years. We know them for, for five, 10, 15 years, the local coffee shop, the local restaurant, the local, you know, um, the local boutique shop, you know, those people that are embedded in these societies that your kids went to and that they, your kids are older now, they have worked there, right? Those are the ones you stop by, they know you by name, you know them by name, you know their kids, right? You, you see them evolve in the community. Those have given back to these economies. They have taken care of these societies, right? We know them every day. We've seen them every way. We can call them up on our names, right? We walk into them and, and they say, hey, Ayman, hey, Winslow, right? You want the usual, you want your usual coffee or do you want the muffin or, you know, this weekend, uh, you know, they, you, you go to a, see a baseball game or a soccer game or a football game and you see kids running around with t-shirts you know, sponsored by the, by the, by, 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 by the local, you know, um, company that fixes, you know, your, your electricity, right? Or, or a company, you know, those are fabric of society, right? Those are what I call ideal human enterprises because they're there, they're living, they're being, they're existing to be part of the evolution and, and, and the benefit of society. So what do we do with them? Well, we talk about the SDGs. We need them to be more conscious about the climate. That's where the intervention comes in. We tell them saying, listen, recycling, we need to work on your recycling. We need to work about your electricity consumption. We need to work about you not using plastic. We need to use, you know, we can create these interventions with them to improve them because every small business counts. And at the same time, this is where we, see, we can fix these things to move them from moderate to ideal, right? And that's the magic. I mean, it's not that complicated. This is where the magic is. This is where education, where schools, where high schools, where middle schools, where universities can come in and help educate the ecosystem, right? At the same time, we know the companies that are coming in to do harm in our community, and we can stop them through neighborhood watches, through civic engagement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Humane entrepreneurship starts, I believe, with the micro entry and moves up to the Fortune 100 company, but it all is run by humans. Dr. Winslow, you wanna jump in here and give some examples as well? Yes, yes, I think that it's important that um, when, when we think of our responsibilities to the planet, um, that we've been, um, we, we have 
the we are we are the cage we are the caretakers of of this earth and this earth will has produced um, food and, and, and give us shelter and give us what what we need to survive and prosper but but there is a contract that we have that as long as we're able to um, to give back and to maintain then the earth will maintain us the challenge is, of course, is that we've taken and, and, and things have been um, been out of balance. And so that's why when we look at entrepreneurship, when we look at there are companies who seek to um, to empower and so in, in empower the individuals within their community, like Dr. Ayman Terabishi said, um, in each one of our communities, there are those restaurants, there are those businesses who care about the environment, care about the air communities. And, and, and so what we say is that um, when we think of that, that hum, humans, we humans, we possess creativity, something that robots don't have or cultural agility or an empathy. That's something that we have. And so we can understand um, each other and, and we have the ability to take information from one context and apply it to the next. And so when we think of humane on, uh, entrepreneurship, it is empathy, you know? And so I, I know that Dr. Derbisha will go through what are some of the qualities of humane entrepreneurship. One that really stands out to me is empathy, that you need to be able to empathize with your community and or with the environment that you live in. And so th that makes a powerful bond. And so, um, and so these are why, we believe that going forward that humane entrepreneurship will not just be a frame, will, but it will be the center in terms of commerce, in terms of how we build a sustainable society. Thank you. Right. The humane entrepreneurship for us really falls quickly to, what, to one of the SDGs, which is good health and well-being, which is the United Nations SDG number three. If you look at all of them, they're all interconnected with humane entrepreneurship. But good health and well-being really hits home for us when it comes to humane entrepreneurship. And in particular, if you look at all the SDGs here, SDG number three is interconnected with everything, right? From all the goals, from, from climate, right? To, to no poverty, to, to basically, to, to zero hunger, to everything here. SDG number three, I believe, is a connector. And humane entrepreneurship maybe is powering what we call good health and well-being, right? How do we do it? How do we get to SDG number three? My proposal is we apply humane entrepreneurship. Now we're running out of time and we're not gonna get into the features of each of humane entrepreneurship. He gave a little bit away of it with Dr. Winslow here with empathy here, but we will continue these webinar series here. Next week, we'll be, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be launching a, a report on the first, um, on the second Humane Entrepreneurship Conference we did, Norris was guest speaker and other keynote luminaries came in and spoke on it, right? So next week, we will be publishing a full report on humane entrepreneurship um, that we did back in uh, June and, and what it is. So if you're interested in learning more about humane entrepreneurship, understanding the different context of humane entrepreneurship, this report is gonna be published next Wednesday. So this was just a little preview of what we will be discussing in the report and different keynote speakers. We have webinars in it. We have thought pieces in it. So it's, it's an exciting report that's coming out here. Um, but I want to stop here to just get as many people um, um, answering, uh, asking questions or commenting here, right? And I just want to start this because this is a, a discussion that we are going to have and continue to have in the next uh, months about this concept of humane entrepreneurship and how you can apply it here. And we welcome a lot of people, we welcome more research, we welcome more input, and we welcome a debate because with debate, things get better. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please share them in the chat box here and Winslow and I will read them and address them as best as we can. Right here. Um, so Winslow, do you have any comments to say while people are writing? Um. Well, I think that um, what you've outlined is a really good uh, 
Foundation. For those of you who are new to humane entrepreneurship, this is um, this is uh, uh, a good introduction, but also uh, as Dr. Armin El Terabishi shared, um, um, and I wish that Dr. Keyshawn Kim was here as well. I, I know he's with us. That we welcome your input because it's through the discussion, it's through the dialogue, it's through the, your research, it's through your examples, it's through this exchange, we're able to build on the knowledge and and refine it such that it can apply to your individual situation and your country. I see that there's a question here with regard to um, humane entrepreneurship and sustainability and the connection that in some countries where resources are constrained, that it might be difficult. Um, I, I think what we're saying in that you have countries, to some extent, they have they are already constrained with what we call natural resources. They don't have gold, they don't have diamonds, they don't have oil. But yet what they've been able to do is tap into the human resources, the human talents, such that they're major exporters of goods and services and they have built up their society in terms of literacy. So it's not a matter of resources in the traditional sense in terms of, of um, aluminum or gold or, or diamonds or oil, but it's more in terms of education, that if you can ed educate, that if you can empower your our youth, women and, and, and the elderly, then you create an environment where they're going to um, create economic activity via entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I wanna address this question here because a lot of people say, well, it's very difficult. It's very challenging. It's, it's somewhat impossible here. And the answer is, it, it depends on how you frame the problem. Because if you think you're gonna to try to change it overnight, right? Yes, it's impossible. But there is ways of starting to improve it. Let me give you some concrete examples. I see Sylvia here as well, and other people here. At GW, right, we are new venture competition that we do with ideas starting up. We ask all of them with all their ideas is to tag which of the SDGs that their new idea might help resolve. If you look now online, a lot of new venture competitions around the United States and around the world are asking the youth when they're coming up with these new business ideas to tell them which of the 17 SDGs you think your idea will help solve. Is it poverty? Is it education? Is it gender equality? What might that be? Right? So it starts with the youth. It starts with the young people saying, if you have an idea, tell us how it can help one of these SDGs. Right? That's an incremental change. But multiply this by 1,000, by 100,000, by a million, by 10 million youth understanding the SDGs, understanding that their ideas might help improve one of the SDGs. Now you have a movement. Right? It doesn't have to be top down. It can be bottom up. And that's something you all should be considering here. There's a comment here that says, um, Bami divided entrepreneurship idea into productive, unproductive, imitative, and destructive. But productive or not depends on the stakeholder. Correct. Yes, I'm thinking a more nuanced model looking of the humane construct. Maybe it is. But what we're looking at, we know which companies are creating harm. We know which companies are in it for just bottom line. We need to identify them. We need to stop them in any way and capacity. And we have to need to promote and support those ones that have a continuous virtuous cycle. I hope that makes sense. Any other comments or questions? And also building on to that, um, Dr. El Terabishi, in, in terms of resources and talent, what we know um, is that Human talent is not localized to any region, any gender, any religion, race, height. It's spread out. There's talent that is generally is available. It's how do you create an ecosystem where that talent, where that those can be put to use. I know that when I was um, at the US Small Business Administration as the Chief Counsel for Advocacy and I commissioned studies, what we found, especially within the US context, that the majority of 
the entrepreneurs in, in the US were immigrants. A, a large percentage were immigrants or first generation or children of immigrants. Likewise, when you see those in universities, especially within the tech fields, you see a large percentage of, of international students. And so, uh, and so the US has benefited tremendously because it has an ecosystem where it allows those who have talent, who has, and, and they may not have money, but they have talent, where they're able to use that, use their talent to create um, new science and new ideas and, and, and entrepreneurship. Likewise, we know that talent is, is distributed throughout every country, every region. It's a matter of how do you tap into and create an, an ecosystem so that those can, um, those can apply their talents um, to where they are. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Winslow, um, to, to give a closing remark on this, and then I'll close it and we'll end it because it's nine o'clock, almost nine o'clock exactly. Yes, yes. Well, well, I just wanna thank you again for this forum. Um, what's great about these webinars is that although we're physically distant, we're more socially connected than others than ever. And in light of COVID-19, I hope that you're keeping safe and that you and that um, and and that these discussions are helpful and it's going to spur ideas and thoughts to build on to um, to the whole premise of humane on, on entrepreneurship. We need you um, to be engaged, involved, and, and we welcome your ideas. ICSB is focused on promoting um, you and to and to providing education that meets needs where you are. So if you have any ideas or thoughts around how we can help to um, to add in holes that you may have or you may think that we need to address, please let us know because we're most effective when we hear from you. And so I just want to thank you again for taking time out of your night, your day, your evening to uh, dialogue with us and. Uh, Thank you, Dr. El Tarabishi. Thank you, Dr. Keyshawn Kim. Do thank you, Dr. Roberto Parenti. Thank you, all of those who have put together this concept of humane entrepreneurship. Thank you for the board of, uh, of ICSB, of Ahmed Osman, Rita, um, Jeff Alves, everyone who have really contributed, Norris Kruger, because it's in this, in keeping of what you do, we, we, you, you help us to rise to another level. So I just want to thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Winslow. Um, I'm delighted to have you here tonight. Again, this is the start of a dialogue. And um, we, as, as Dr. Winslow said, we welcome you more, but more importantly, I invite all of you. If you have um, a 250 word, uh, 300 word article you want to share, an opinion you want to share with us, all right, this is the platform for ICSB. We welcome all your input. Please email it to us. Please email it to me directly as well. All right, and we, we run a lot of articles in our website, in our newsletters, in our that. So we will welcome more input, both in ag agreeing with the concept or actually not agreeing with the concept. Right, that is how we make things better. Right, this is what we call the open dialogue and the open platform. So I invite you all. Um, you can send us the articles both in English, but I also see Sylvia here. So Sylvia, it can also be in Spanish, right? We welcome Spanish and French as well. And Winslow will read it in French as well, right? So, right? So, so, any, so if you have different languages, please send to us. We have a global community here and we welcome it in other languages as well. So with that, um, and I, I invite you all to continue with us here. Thank you for coming this evening on a Wednesday night. I know we're all busy here but I look forward to continuing these webinar series with all of you. Have a wonderful night, everyone. And our new theme for the fall is not stay safe, but thrive. So let us thrive this fall. Thank you, everybody. Thank Good night. You.